the phrase, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. We've all heard that phrase, right? Children love to imitate and make fun of and play. What, what, what's that game they always play? The, the, the repeat after me game? Mimic me game? God, that's so terribly annoying. All the time. Stop copying me. Exactly, Gretchen. Exactly. One of Jordan's favorite things to do is he'll pretend to be somebody, a character or uh, uh, somebody from a movie or whatever, and he'll do it, and then you'll call him that name, and he will get very mad and say, no, I'm not that. I'm Jordan. I'm just imitating that. Right? that that's the sincerest form of flattery. They, they want to be somebody, right? And, and of course, that phrase itself is a take on Oscar Wilde, the Irish poet, his statement that he made many, many years ago, and the idea behind that statement is that if you really want to impress somebody, then imitate them. If you would flatter them, if you would copy what somebody does. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he says to a bunch of young teenage fishermen, come and follow me. And he was inviting them not to some magical destination, but he was inviting them to a life of imitation. When Jesus says, come and follow me, when he says that to the, the disciples, when he says it to you and to me, he's inviting them to a life of imitation. Jesus is inviting you and he's inviting me to, to come, let him be in our lives, let him show us the way. My highest aspiration as a follower of Jesus is that one day somebody would encounter me and say, was that Sean or was that Jesus? We're a long way from that point, but at some point. But the theological word for this phrase is sanctification. Sanctification. It's a 25 cent theological word that basically means becoming more like Jesus. Becoming more like the creator, whose image we were created to be. And it doesn't mean that we're going to wear robes and sandals and walk around the Sea of Galilee, but it means that we will become the person we were created to be, made in the image of God. We will become the masterpiece that God created us to be. And this is what it means to be sanctified, to be more like Jesus, to imitate Jesus. And the journey with Jesus begins with a gift. When you say yes to Jesus, you're accepting the gift of salvation, the gift of being made right with God. Salvation is a free gift from the creator, but let's understand this a little bit better. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2 about that. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from who? Yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is not about good works. If you are on a good works plan, I have two words for you. Good luck. Good luck. All you have to do is accept the gift and you're saved. You have salvation, but it doesn't end there. That's the first half of the gospel. The second half of the gospel is all about sanctification. The very next verse in Ephesians 2, Paul says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the Bible says we are not saved by our good works. We are saved for good works, to do the good works that God has set before us. Jesus phrased this a little differently in the Gospels. In Matthew 11, he said this. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Read this underlined sentence with me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. In the first century, a rabbi, a teacher of the faith, hit the summary of his teaching, the, the full body of his, what he taught was called his yoke. And here's what Jesus is saying. We get to choose whether we put on the yoke of the world, the yoke of somebody else, the yoke of whatever you want to put on, or we can choose to put on the yoke of Jesus. We can put on, yoke ourselves, tie ourselves down to all the other things we can choose to follow, or we can tie ourselves to the yoke of Jesus, the rabbi. We've been in this series, Ready, Set, Go. This is the second week in this series, 
And we've been learning in this series, what we're, we're trying to teach ourselves is that we are always students, students of the teacher. We're always learning and growing. And we need to restart our walk with Jesus once in a while and remind ourselves, remind ourselves that we have more to learn. Because until we are fully imitating Jesus, we're not fulfilling our creation. Last week we talked about this imitation is about walking down well-worn paths, ancient paths of prayer. Following the way Jesus did in prayer. And here's the thing, Jesus was fully God and fully human, right? He grew up in a home with a mother and a father in a Jewish village. But people in the Jewish village in the first century in Palestine didn't live like we do in the 21st century. They lived their faith every hour of the day, 24-7. Didn't matter where they were or what they were doing, their faith was first and foremost. If we're honest, most of us tend to divide our lives into the, the 167 hours we spend outside of church and the one hour or so we spend at church but not our Jewish friends and not Jesus. He models for us a way to live our life that we might imitate it. And when you read the scriptures, the New Testament and the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, you find in Luke 2, we find the first example of where Jesus worshipped, the home that he grew up in. And here's what it says in Luke 2. It says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them, his mother and father. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. And this is the first of three places that we find Jesus worshiping in the home. He grew up in a home, and we don't know a lot about Jesus' young life. But Luke records that Joseph and Mary created a home where the faith was the first and foremost thing in their lives. And in that he grew in wisdom and in stature. Now, for Jewish followers of God, the home was the primary place they learned about God. And I want to speak a word to folks that are parents and grandparents today or might be thinking about being parents. I want to remind you that what happens in your house is far more important than what happens in a schoolhouse. It's far more important than what happens in this house. And it's far more important than what happens in the White House. Because the home is the primary place where your children will catch the faith. Do you know if your child or grandchild spends an hour and a half on average in church every week from birth to 18, every Sunday, you know how long they will be in church? About 1,400 hours. That sounds like a lot until you realize that that is the equivalent of 58 days in 18 years. The church can only do but so much. 58 days. Do the math, 18 times 365 minus 58. The rest of those days, it's on parents, it's on grandparents, on family members. That imitation of Jesus that you walk in every day, that's what your children will catch. It's an awesome privilege and an awesome responsibility. And Joseph and Mary taught Jesus about following God in their home. The second place Jesus worshipped was in the village synagogue. There's this pattern we find in the Gospels, in three of the four Gospels, where Jesus, is, when he begins his ministry, he's baptized, he goes to the desert to be tempted by the evil one, and then he returns home to his little village of Nazareth, and he goes to the synagogue. Now remember, Nazareth is not a big city. Nazareth is a backwater town, crossroads town, a one-stop sign kind of town, right? A few hundred people maybe live there at this time and age. But yet he goes home and he goes to that synagogue. And the, listen to what the Bible tells us about Jesus returning home in Luke 4. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue. What does that say underlined? As was his custom. Remember last week? Jesus praying in the garden. As was his custom. This wasn't the first time Jesus had been to the synagogue. The synagogue in a town like Nazareth would have been the center of social life. It would have been the town hall as well as the church. The synagogue was the main point where everybody gathered. And here, Jesus regularly came to this place. And here's a question that occurred to me this week. It had never occurred to me in my years of studying the faith and this story. I wonder if, 
The reason Jesus always goes back to the temple, and all three of the Gospels, goes to the synagogue as soon as he comes out of the wilderness. He knows that in three years he's going to die. He knows what the call of his life is. He knows what's in front of him. And the first place he goes is to his synagogue in his hometown. To be around the people who loved him most and best. And to be in his father's house who loved him most and best. So Jesus went to the church. He went to the synagogue. And you know how many times in the Gospels Jesus goes to the synagogues? At least 17 times. At least 17 times. Jesus went there as usual, as was his custom. The third place Jesus worshipped was in the temple in Jerusalem. Now the, the Old Testament law prescribed that Jewish men had to go to Jerusalem three times a year, no matter where they lived, to celebrate one of the festivals. Now we're, we're not given much about Jesus' teenage life, but we do get one story at the end of Luke chapter 2. Look at the screen. Verse 41. It says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And then in verse 46, it says, after three days, they found him. Remember, they had lost Jesus. They find Jesus in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And when they confront him and say, what are you doing? Where have you been? What is his answer in verse 49? Why were you looking for me? Classic teenager, right? You should have known where I was. Where would I be anywhere else? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? No matter what you say about Jesus, Jesus was a worshiper at home, in the village synagogue, in the temple in Jerusalem, in the garden of Gethsemane. If imitation is indeed the highest form of flattery, then like Jesus, we need to flatter him by being worshipers. And I'm not just talking about the hour we spend in here. I'm talking about the other 167 hours of our day, of our week. I'm talking about making worship a part of who we are, an all-inclusive way of living. Worship is not somewhere we go or something we do, but it's the way we live our lives. How would your life be different if when you were shopping for groceries, you did it as an act of worship? How would your life be different instead of being caught up in the craziness of everyday life, you lived every moment with a sense of where do I see God now? Where do I see God today? I read an article last year, and I couldn't find it. I was going to cite it for you, but I couldn't find it again today, uh, this week. But an article about, called Beauty Hunters. This idea where there is wisdom in living in an, with an attentiveness towards the beauty of creation. And I would expand that, kind of turn that up a little bit. It suggests that we not simply see the beauty of creation, but that we live the words of that classic hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. Y'all heard that song? You know the song? For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all, to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. What if we lived everything we did in life that way? If everything we did was with a sense of awe and wonder and worship and looking for God's presence? What if the sunrise today or the promise of rain later in the week can I get an amen for rain later in the week? Yeah, we need some, right? What if when that, that rain comes pouring down, it runs off and it causes puddles and overflow everywhere in your property? You said, you know what, God, thank you. Thank you for making the rain. What if our life would be different if we were beauty hunters and we looked to the creator? We were men and women who lived a life of doxology, of praise and thanksgiving. And if you want to know today's message in a sentence, here it is. Worship is being present with and intentionally aware of God's presence in every area of our lives. Dr. Henry Now, and the, the theologian and wonderful man, Reverend Dr. Henry Now, said, getting answers to my questions is not the goal of spiritual life. Living in the presence of God is the greater goal. I think so many of us, we spend time looking for answers instead of looking for God. It's not to say that questions aren't good, that questions aren't helpful, but what if we spent our days trying to seek to live in the presence of God? That's what we're invited to do. That's what Jesus did. That's what he invites us to live out this greater calling, this consistent and constant awareness of the creator. That is worthy of our imitation. And Jesus models it, but he doesn't just model it, friends. He teaches it. 
In John chapter 4, Jesus has an encounter in Samaria with this woman. Now, much like C.S. Lewis, y'all get tired of hearing me talk about C.S. Lewis, y'all get tired of hearing me talk about this story in the gospel. But I think perhaps it is one of the most impactful stories in all of scripture. This woman at the well in Samaria, she has a messed up life, just like you and I have messed up lives. This wake of broken relationships. And Jesus did what we all ought to do when he encounters her. He models a different way to be in relationship. He led with grace, and then he follows with truth. He sees the woman, and he offers her living water. Now, she has to come to this well in Samaria every day. And she's tired of doing it, having to do it in the hot of the day, so she avoids everybody else. She says, Jesus, give me some of this water. I'm tired of being thirsty. I don't want to have to come here anymore. And Jesus says, you don't understand. And he offers himself to her. He offers grace to her. But then, as he always does, he offers grace, but he follows it with truth. He follows the truth. He says, why don't you go get your husband? And she says, well, you see, Jesus, I don't technically have a husband. Right? What she didn't say is the next part that Jesus says to her. Yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And you're living with somebody now who is not your husband. Now, all of a sudden, she's mortified. She's busted because Jesus has led with grace. He's offered her this water, but he's also given her the truth. And he's going to do that for you, and he's going to do that for me. He meets us in our brokenness and offers us a way towards the living water. And then he says to the woman, he says, let me give you the rest of the story. Here's what the rest of the story says. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Well, of course, he just told you about your entire life, right? Our ancestors, the Samaritans, they worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews, you claim the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, that Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship neither the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come. It's happening now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Read this with me. For God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Jesus has confronted this woman, and she's turned it to their differences. She's turned it to worship. Like, you, you don't understand. We're not the same. But Jesus looks, and he says, yes, we are the same, but not in the way you think. Now, why did she bring this up? Because the Samaritans and the Jews, they didn't like each other. Hatfields and McCoys times ten right? They didn't like each other. The the Samaritans worshipped on the Mount of of Gerizim, and the Jews worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. And she says to Jesus, well, who's right? And Jesus says, well, the Jews are right, but that doesn't really matter right now. But it's not about where you worship. It's about worshipping in spirit and in truth. Jesus says it doesn't matter what your legacy is or where you come from, whether you worship in the temple or the desert, whether you worship on a mountain, whether you worship in person or whether you worship online. It doesn't matter what your location is. What matters is are you worshiping in spirit and in truth? He was telling a messed up person and messed up people today that worship is about this genuine, intimate relationship with the one who created you, with the one who provides living water. It's not about location, it's about heart. And here's the thing, we can't praise Jesus until we are willing to prize Jesus. We can't praise Jesus until we prize Jesus. And my question for you all this morning, for all of us this morning, is are you prizing Jesus? Are you prizing Jesus so you can praise Jesus? Or are you stricken with a a bad case of the yips? Anybody play golf in here? Anybody? You know the yips? Ever heard of the yips? Right? So the yips are basically this. And this has happened to the greatest golfers in the world. In fact, golfing great Tommy Armour, who was the first one to write about it, said, the only thing I can tell you about the yips is this. Once you've had them, you've got them. You're stuck with them. And here's the thing about the yips. You you get over, let me move this, so y'all can see. You're putting, right? Everybody play putt-putt, right? Mini golf? You go to putt, and it's a nice, easy, it's five feet, whatever it is, you just tap it in. Happy Gilmore, just tap it in. 
But when you have the yes, you get there and you can't hit it. You can't see it. The, you can't, there's a disconnection between mind and body. What looks like five feet, all of a sudden you hit it 15 feet. When it's 15 feet, you hit it two feet. There's a disconnect between the body and the mind, and no matter what you see with your eyes, you can't make your body understand what to do. And there really is no cure for the yips except to go back to the very basics of the game of golf. Not just the mechanics of the swing, but how do you swing? Why do you swing that way? The mental part of the game. My hunch is that given the last couple of years, given the reality of life, even without the last couple of years, there are a lot of us, a lot of Christians, who are suffering with spiritual yips. Our mind and our souls are sort of disintegrated. But this morning, Jesus wants to meet you. The Holy Spirit wants to meet you and, and help make that right. So today we're going to do something a little bit different, and we're going to leave. You can go ahead and come on up. We're going to start doing something different. In the past, we've had communion. There's been a, a musical song a, a led by one of our worship leaders, and it's kind of been a nice background music. It's kind of been a nice song that people might like. Come on up, Lee, you can come on up. We're not going to do that. We're, we're going to participate in worship, and we're going to sing a song today called "Heart of Worship." The song was written by one of the most well-known contemporary Christian artists of today. And he wrote it in his church when he felt like they had gotten too far away from what worship was meant to be. They were doing it well, but it wasn't what it was intended to be. And so they got rid of their lights, they got rid of their, their extra music, they got rid of their stage stuff, they got rid of all the extraneous stuff. And they just started singing without instruments. And they wrote this song coming back to the heart of worship. So this morning when we come to, we're going to, Affirm our faith together in a minute. We're going to go through our communion liturgy. But I want it to be an act of worship. One of the reasons we sing the communion responses in this congregation is that it is an important way to continue to worship. It's not just repeating words. And when the time for communion comes, you're going to be invited down by pew as you always are. But I want this to be a time of worship, not just receiving and waiting for everybody else to receive. The altars will be open. You can pray here. You can pray at your seats. You can stand. You can sing. Whatever you want to do. But I want it to be a time of worship. We come before God, our creator, and get back to the heart of what it means to worship God. What does it mean to be in communion with God? What does it mean to receive the living water for the one who loves us most and who loves us best to draw us back to him? That everything we do, not just an hour in here, but everything we do this week, might be an act of worship. That's my prayer for us this week. That in everything we would worship, if you're in school, if you're in work, if you're on a conference call, if you're on a Zoom meeting, somehow that Zoom meeting will be an act of worship. You'll find a way in everything you do to remember that the heart of worship is about spending time with the Creator, with everything we are. Let's pray. Father God, let us start our time of worship, Lord, by simply praying those ancient words, come, Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome here. Spirit of God, fall down upon us, fall fresh on us as individuals, as a church, wherever we are. Father God, give us courage. Give us the self-awareness to recognize that we need you. That we need you in everything we do and that everything we do should be a worshipful act towards you. Pray, Lord, come, Holy Spirit, come. Fill us in this time of worship. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.